Where does your passion for economics come from? Oh, that's a, that's a complicated question. Uh, I actually have passions for a lot of things. I'm lucky. Uh, close to when she uh, passed, my mom taught me something about myself. She said, when you're a kid, you never came to me and said, Mom, I'm bored. I don't know what to do. There's just so many exciting, cool things to do in the world and so many things to learn about. Uh, when, I was, when I was growing up, I was especially passionate about uh, puzzles and games and playing the piano. Uh, and, and I went through phases of different things. Like I read all the, practically all the mystery books in the library and practically all the science fiction books. So I liked, I liked reading too. Uh, but I, I, I kind of went through phases and different things. And I think that, I think that, uh, that all of that really helped me to develop. I mean, I think that uh, playing games gave me a practical feel for probability. I remember I had a little roulette wheel and I had read something about uh, extrasensory perception. And what I read about it's extrasensory perception suggested it should be possible for me to either forecast where the wheel would go, what, what the number would come up, or possibly use my mind to influence the number. And I tried really hard to do both of those, and I tried relaxing and saying, that maybe that'll help. And uh, with the house advantage of my toy roulette wheel, I would always start with a big pile of chips and lose them all. And so I, I began to believe in probability, and uh, I think that gave me a good intuitive feel that and, and playing games and working in puzzles for, for some tools that I, that I end up using later. What made you think that there was more to uncover with bank runs? Well, uh, we weren't looking specifically for deposit insurance when we started. Uh, what we were looking for more was understanding what banks do. We thought banks were a really important part of the economy and we weren't so satisfied with the, uh, with the existing models. Uh, at that time, it wasn't quite true that game theory and economics were separate fields, but it was almost true. Um, an industrial organization, which has a lot of uh, game theoretic models now, uh, people uh, tended tended to do more applied empirical things. And if you, if you write down a theoretical model, they'd say, well, that seems intuitive. Why did you bother? And, uh, but it really helps to formalize things and make clear what assumptions you're making when you're doing things. And uh, uh, Doug had had um, a lot of training in banking as an undergraduate. He knew a lot of banking institutions. He, and once we met, I think, I think it was for a beer at a professional meeting after we had both graduated from, from Yale. Uh, uh, and he said, I think that there's, there are a lot of opportunities for using game theory to model uh, uh, things that are going on in banking. And, and we started working on some different things and some different ideas then. You've said that you don't like to work on the hot topics. How do you come across things that people aren't already thinking about? I don't work that hard not to. I mean, my, if, when I pick problems, I, I try to pick whatever is interesting to me. And there's so many different interesting things in the world. Uh, and I probably do steer away from something where there are so many papers at a particular point in time. And part of that is just because it's a pain because you have all these people who think that the, the only important thing in this area is what they're doing. And, and uh, I don't like getting into those fights. Um, the other thing which, which I hadn't really thought about probably at the, you know, early in my career is that you're not gonna open up a whole new area working on the same problem a lot of other people have been working on. So, um, I, th I think, I think it, that it's, it's probably a good thing. My advice to students is to work on problems you care about. And there can be different reasons that you care about it. It could be that you care about the problem because 
Um, it's something that you think is really important for society. It could be that you care about it because you've seen some papers on this and they make you angry because you think they got it all wrong. And um, a lot of times, uh, really good work comes from saying, you know, I don't believe that result at all. Uh, I think they've got it backwards and then trying to formulate that and, and analyze the question, well, did they really get it backwards? Is my intuition correct? Um, and then doing whatever empirical work or theoretical analysis is needed to answer those questions. I think that's often very interesting. But there can be a lot of different reasons why you care, but it should be something you care about. If you don't care about it, you may as well be, um, uh, you know, an investment manager, and and um, uh, even if you don't like that work, it pays better, and you know, you probably have a, a happier life. But if you if you're really curious about uh, some things that that are uh, of interest to other people, then uh, that curiosity can map into something that's that's you really really useful and, and uh, being a researcher can be a good fit. How do you cope with failure? So part, part, of, uh, part of doing research is that not everything works, but after a little while you kind of understand that. And uh, it would be easy to get frustrated. Sometimes, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're really, I mean, it, it's worse if you're really career-oriented. If you're spending all your time saying, you know, how am I going to get the next promotion or how am I going to get tenure or something? But uh, I think I was lucky. I was young when I got started and I was just lucky I was getting paid to do fun stuff for a few years. And, and that, I think that gave me an advantage. Um, if you work on something for three weeks and in the end you don't have any, very much to show for it, you still learn something. And... Um, the process to get to the final paper includes that. I mean, the thing that you do next, now that you understand what doesn't work, is informed by that. And you couldn't, you know, you'd like to say, okay, next time I'm not going to do that three weeks uh, finding out some things don't work, and I'm go straight to the things that do work, because you don't know that. The only reason you know to try the things that do work is because you've gone through some things that didn't work. And, and you know by exclusion what you should be working on. Um, but uh, uh, it does take a certain personality type. Uh, when I talk to, to students who are going into industry, I tell them that, that uh, there are personality types that have nothing to do with intelligence or training that are really important for what kind of job you select. And the two that I focus on are uh, how much you want to be around people. Now, some people say, you know, I love people, I like to hang with my friends after work, but I'd rather just have quiet time in a cubicle where I'm working by myself uh, most of the time at my, at my day job. And other people will say, uh, working in a cubicle all day, uh, I'd go crazy, I can't do that. Uh, I can do it for two years to get to the point where I can do the other job that I really want, but uh, that's not going to be for me. So those are two different personality types. They have nothing to do with intelligence or training. The other thing is how impatient people are. And there's some people who just need immediate feedback all the time. So they want to know how they're doing. And other people who don't care so much about immediate feedback, they can work on something for months, no big deal. Uh, but they want to check and double check everything. They want to sleep on it. They don't want, don't want to, I mean, the, the extreme version, uh, you want to have something that you can do for two months and, and, and abandon it if it's not working. And the research is more like that. Being a trader is more like the immediacy. A trader would like to have a program where you do an Indianapolis 500 race at double the real speed. <laughs> and that kind of immediate feedback is what they thrive on. So, so I think, I think that, that uh, if you're a personality type who's patient and you really like doing the work, you're curious about it, um, maybe the process is just as important for your satisfaction as the result is. And that's the right personality type. 
Do you ever feel pressure knowing so many people have read, cited or built upon your work? Oh, I'm pretty good at not feeling pressure, uh, especially about my research. I, I think of it as free advertising. It's like royalties. I mean, people keep citing the paper, I get attention, and uh, I haven't done anything on that in, since the 80s. Um, I worked on a lot of other things. Uh, I should probably talk to the foundation about managing their endowment, because I've been working on, uh, that's one of the topics I've been working on recently. But um, uh, in, in terms of did I expect it, I think Doug may have had an idea that it would be a really popular paper, but uh, I didn't really expect it. Um, I, I kind of assume things, I don't know, I, I, I kind of assume things aren't there until they happen. Why do you think it's important for students and researchers to approach and explain complicated subjects? The, the goal is to make the comp, is to find what you can learn about the complicated subject using simple arguments. And I think one of, the, one of the things we accomplished by working so hard uh, is, is to make the paper simple. And because the paper is simple, it's relatively easy for students to read it, and it's also uh, a paper that many people have extended. Because we made the model so simple, people can add uh, different things to it and they can still solve it. And I think that that's one of the reasons for its success. For students who are trying to approach complicated subjects, what advice do you have for them? Uh, a lot, most things are, are not so complicated if you look at it the correct way. Uh, I often tell my students that math is either impossible or easy. If you know it, it's easy. If you don't know it, it's impossible. And you know, there are some things that you can figure out on the fly that end up kind of in between, so you can work hard. It's difficult, but, but um, the goal is to, to look at some, some, something that's complicated and uh, form a simple understanding about it and then investigate how robust that is. Was there a person who influenced you? I'm kind of unusual for the current uh, current, I'm, I'm getting to be old man now, but, but for my vintage, I'm, I'm more old school and I work on a lot of different things. And that was true of my mentors, uh, that, it, that there was a feeling of being broad. And if you look at my different papers, they're on very different topics. Uh, I worked on banking and I haven't ever decided I wouldn't work on banking anymore but I haven't ever had anything I thought was that important to say yet. And uh, so, uh, and for me, I skip from topic to topic. As I mentioned, I'm working now on, on a paper on, on managing money for foundations and preservation of capital. I have, I have work on decision-making and hierarchies. I have, um, I don't know, and I've worked for a, on how to, uh, design contracts for traders. Uh, I, just, I just tend to work on a lot of different things. I've had papers on optimal warranties. Um, in my noble lecture, I'll talk about some very early papers on labor economics. So, so I like working on a lot of different things. And I think that you learn something from working on one type of problem that's useful for others. How do you maintain your curiosity? Oh, oh, the, the, way, the way I, stay curious is, uh, is just to try to stay above the fray and there are people who are trying to cut you down sometimes and you just you just try to ignore them and keep going. Um, it's uh, I think I think uh, it's uh, I don't know there's a kind of a childlike uh, uh, thing. I think it probably helps that I've always been immature. <laughs> Sorry, nobody ever accused me of being mature for my age. But, uh, but I think it's just, just, uh, just staying open to it. Part of it is just staying open to it and not getting into a grind, getting into too much of a routine. 
Can you tell us about the object that you're donating to the Nobel Prize Museum? Okay, so I think one of the sources of my um, intellectual ability is that when I was growing up, I was passionate about games and puzzles and music. And I couldn't find anything that survived having to do with games or puzzles, but I brought in a piece of music that I liked. Um, I think the passion is important. If somebody says, oh, I want to be a Nobel Prize winner, I should do games and puzzles and music, I think that misses the point. I think you need something that you're passionate about that will keep you focused and get you using your brain and help you to develop some discipline and some, some uh, habits of, of persistence to be able to solve problems or do things. And uh, music is one thing that's always done that for me. It's also been uh, grounding for me. It's helped me to, to, to get back to a kind of a uh, stable place even if, if my emotions are going crazy. Do you think it's important to have hobbies outside of your research? So, uh, I'm not sure that it's important to have hobbies outside your research. Uh, all I know is that that worked for me, and that was useful for me. Um, I mean, I worry a little bit that kids tend to be too structured these days. They have a karate class, and they have the, the ballet, then they have a music class, and. And it's like they, they don't have time to be creative. I mean, I think for creative, you, you need kind of play time, which is, which is unstructured. And I think, I think that, uh, that for creativity, it's really good to have had that. And I think, I, think, I think that was good for me. I mean, I had a chemistry set, just about caught the house on fire a couple times. Um, that was also, you know, that was probably more important than going through a book with experiment one after another uh, in terms of, you know, developing my creativity. It does help a lot to have, I think a lot of creativity is putting together uh, things in a new way and just being exposed to a lot of different things gives you more building blocks to put together. What skills are important for students or researchers to develop? I think you want to work hard to find out what it is that you like doing, what you care about. And it doesn't have to be for any noble or big reason, but it should be something that means something to you. That if you have a job that you don't care about, there's nothing in the job that you care about, that's going to be miserable. If you start on a research project, research is hard work. If you don't care about it, working on it three hours a week is going to be hard work. If you care about it, it's, it's fun or at least interesting or satisfying to work on it 60 hours a week. And so, so try to structure your life so that you're, that you're doing things that, that uh, mean something to you. And it doesn't have to be. You know, it might be that it's, that it's something that's always gr also great for the world, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to be something that means something to you.